Hi, I'm Mike Caddick. I've been a stonemason all my life. Our family has been in business 70 years. And today I'm going to do a video on what I see as a stonemason on the archaeological site of Ailante Tambo. So just to get to see where you are, this is the town of Ailante Tambo. And right here is the archaeological site. So when you come into the town and you're going to Machu Picchu, you get on the Inca Rail down here. It's about a 20 minute walk or for a dollar the guy will take you on one of those motorcycle rickshaws. But everything that we're going to show you today is right in this area. Well, That's the place you get in right there and you give your guy your ticket. And we just look up here and then you got to climb all them steps all the way up to there and all the, all the ruins are up in that area. And we're walking up the steps to Ilafambo. I don't think they're in code, but everybody's doing it. These are the stone walls going up in there. And as we're walking up the steps towards the Temple of the Sun, there's a lot of these walls and a lot of these protrusions that stick out. I think most people who move heavy things for a living would say that's what they were used for. Here's some more stonework as we go. You can see this is where they just filled in between years later. Now I'm a stonemason so when I do stonework the first thing I gotta do is get the product. Where's the product right here cut from? It's cut from a stone quarry in this case it was cut from a granite stone quarry. So when you go to the stone quarry you order the stone you want to get and then if they have a carver there they carve the stones to fit against each other as best they can. Then the owner approves the stones and they get shipped to the job. That's the mover's part. I don't move the stones. I'm a stonemason. The carver don't move the stones. He's a carver. The quarry guy don't move the stones. He's the quarry guy. The movers move them. So they get on a job site and they bring them to the stonemason. My job as a stonemason is to place them. Now anytime I get stone, I have to do the finishing edges. Sometimes I try to put them together and they don't fit. So let's look at first what I see. What I'm looking under here is stones. You see the stones under here? This is laying on stones. This looks like it's laying on bedrock. This is on bedrock, but this is laying on stones. And just by looking at it, I think this is original when they put it in. And when you move this over a little bit, this piece, this bench, this is laying on stones. This you could believe was put at a later date. But these are all original. That means they put the shims in here. And let's look at why they put the shims in. We're looking at the way they put these things in, how tight they are, and how big these stones are. Now we're going to stop right here. If you can see what I see, you see that cursor going up and down? This right here is a big crack in that stone. Now anytime you're pounding on a stone, they probably brought it from the quarry and there was no crack in it. But as they're pounding on it to get it to uh, form the way they wanted to form, the stone started to crack. So what are they going to do? They're going to get rid of this stone and go back to the quarry and do a whole other stone again and try to make it fit? It might take them two, three months to do that. So they come over here and they put these shims in. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And the reason I picked up on that right away is because I was on a job where that actually happened to us, where we had to use little shims to make up for it. Also underneath that big stone there, you can see the shims, except it's not carved fancy. But I'm going to do a little carving demonstration. I'm going to prove that you don't need iron tools to do this. Now this is my brother Jeff, and he actually sells granite stones. And he's going to talk a little bit about them, just to explain it. What kind of granite is this, Jeffrey? Well, this is, uh, this is that rose-colored granite. And it's uh, the same stuff that they used in Egypt in a lot of the projects out there when they use granite. This is just a regular basic granite, tombstone granite. But these are Belgian block, and obviously they come from different areas. And it depends what minerals are in them. I mean, this granite here is like a, you know, granite that they stuck in the old farmhouses and everything. Very, very, this is very hard to work with. Matter of fact, this came off my yeah. property, and uh, I've never seen stone so hard as this. Could this stone be shaped with another stone, no problem? Yeah, I mean, you know, as long as you have a harder stone and you beat on it long enough, you can. One thing about granite, it's very predictable if you want to snap it. 
Right. You know, yeah. these types of granites you could snap anywhere you want. If you score them and snap them, they'll snap perfect. This one here, not so much. Depends what minerals are in it. Okay, and once I get it down and I want to polish it, what would I do ancient way? Well, you just take a flat stone, very flat stone, and you would put water on there and sand. Water and sand and back and forth and back and forth and around. And it would take that right down and give that like a honed finish, almost like a polished finish. I, matter of fact, years ago when I put my countertops in, I did them by hand with sandpaper. I did all the edges by hand and they come out just as beautiful as the top. Can certainly be done. Now these are the two stones that my brother brought me. And if you look at them, you want to get them close. You got a big bump right here. So what you do is if you're a carver, I'm not a carver, you look at it, it's straight except for about here, but I got this big bump here. So how long is it going to take me to get this bump off? Well, I'll just take another piece of granite and I'll just start hitting it. And when you hit it, you hit it in, you hit it in towards the rock, because if you hit it out, you'll chip the sides off. So you always kind of hit it in. And depending on how much you want to take off, see, look at it all coming off of there. Everybody says, oh, you can't do that. Don't you know you need aliens to help you? Look at it. It's coming off. No big deal. You can see it. You need uh, special tools. They couldn't do it that way. So it's 30 minutes later. It took me 30 minutes to get that spot off. Look at the stone. You can see where it's beat. It's still holding up. Once in a while a piece will flake off. But that's it. It's not a big deal. Look at how much I took off already. I got that whole thing off. If I want to take that little piece off, I just beat on a little bit. Look at it. It's coming off. It's not a big deal. It just takes a long time. And you let the stone do the work. See that knob coming off? Look at it. Came off already. See that? I get down here. Now I'm going to draw a line here and go straight down. If I go straight down, I chip that off. See. See that? Oh, you need special tools. You need chisels. The aliens are going to help you. Come on. Now when I went to this site, this was the number one stone that I wanted to see. I seen this on a Brian Forrester video. I'm a fan of his. He's out there as an archaeologist and he's uncovering a lot of facts that I believe he's right. I believe that is a Samark. I've been a mason a long time. I seen a lot of videos in Egypt where they're using copper tools and they got drills to drill through the, the granite also. I believe he's correct there. Was that stone soft at one time? I know when you quarry stone in Pennsylvania and you rip it out of the ground, it's a lot softer than if it sits out in the weather for a year. Race car drivers, what they do is they get an engine and they let it sit for a year because it hardens up before they start using it. Now, was stone soft? Is there a way to soften granite? I don't know unless you bury it back in the ground under a certain heat or something. I know heat softens metal. I'm sure it softens stone. I'm not an expert on that, but I do want to say, as far as I'm concerned, that is a saw mark. And I've seen a lot of other stones that I believe have saw marks in them. Now before we walk off the mountain, I want to show you the town of Ayante Tambo from where we're standing, up near the Temple of the Sun, and where that saw mark was. So we're looking across the way and there's a lot of ruins all over this town. You could spend days and weeks here and there's a face there on the left hand side. Now when we're walking down the mountain you see all these stones, megalithic stones that look like they're cast all around. And they always talk to scientists and the theologists about a cataclysmic event. I'll talk about that at the end. But when you get down to the bottom they have a lot of examples of stones again. And here's these funny looking sheep again with these long necks. I never, never seen one like that before. There's a stone with saw, and it looks like that was made out of mud, and someone just reached in and grabbed it out. So here we go with my comment at the end. 
I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I did a lot of other videos in archaeological sites like Conway Castle in Wales, the Cathedral of St. John's in New York City. I did the Coral Castle down in Florida, and I was up on the Great Wall of China. The Great Wall of China is 13,000 miles long. It goes way up over the top of mountains and down through valleys and everything. Machu Picchu, Aliatambo, Sacsayhuaman, all them are not really that big. They're, uh, and when I was up there on Machu Picchu, I didn't see anything that couldn't be duplicated. I know I only did a little, little sample, but I have to say that it's not, it's a beautiful postcard. It's a nice place to see. You're up in the Andes. Uh, the clouds are going through, but it's not as impressive as everybody says it is. Uh, people ask me, Mike, how come they put those stones all so close together like that and they're so fine? Well, first of all, they didn't have cement. They weren't using cement in those days. And one time I was re rebuilding this retaining wall and there's a snake looking out at me and I'm looking at it, scared the hell out of me. The more tight you put everything, the less critters can get through. That's what I'm trying to say. Last time I did a video on Machu Picchu, I got all these, uh, you know, it's the ET, it's the aliens, it's this theory, it's that theory. A couple years back, some friends of mine from Canada came through going to Florida and this guy was a nuclear scientist, physicist. He taught physicists in school. He worked in the Navy on the nuclear ships and he was a professor. He teaches uh, college on physics. So he's telling me about the photons and the protons and all this stuff and he, I'm bringing him back. I say, where did this come from? Where did that come from? Where did this come from? And he brought me all the way back to the Big Bang and says, it was the size of a pea and it blew up and what happened is it created time, space and matter. So as a scientist they say well if anything developed from that it was by intelligent, intelligent design. So the theologists say in the beginning that's time, God that's who created it, the heavens and the earth which is space and matter. What's the difference? Now Albert Einstein says and let me read it People like us who believe in physics know that the distinction between the past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. In other words, is what he's saying is time is bendable. You could be bended by mass, you could bend it by gravity, and time is adjustable. And this is what Ecclesiastes says, which is theology. It says, that which has been is now, and that which is to be hath already been. Here's the point. If you don't have the sun, and you don't have the moon, and you don't have movement, there's no way to measure time. So time eternity is something that is compressed, it could be cut, it can go forward, it can go backward. And if there is aliens, I don't know. And if there is, God probably created them. But if there are, I want to get a class action lawsuit against them because of discrimination. They come down to this planet with all their highfalutin technology, and they don't tell them about the Roman arch. They don't tell them that they could use cement where they don't have to be beaten on the stones or anything. They don't tell them about the wheel. I was in Tulum. The guide said they didn't have the wheel here. They carried everything by hand on their backs. So they, they didn't share the technology. They discriminated against us. It's a hate crime as far as I'm concerned. And some of you might say that's circumstantial evidence, but there's been a lot of convictions on circumstantial evidence. So if you know any aliens, you let me know. Thanks for watching the videos. I got a lot more to do on Peru, back to Egypt. Thanks for watching. I'm Mike Haddock. Until next time.